In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I think it's December, and now finally, I think the year 2017, I think is mercifully coming to a close. I think if we look at this year, I think all of us would probably agree that 2017 has been a rough year. You know, we are, we've been closer to nuclear catastrophe with North Korea than we've been with anybody in decades. You know, Washington, D.C. seems to be a mess. Uh, you know, we have the whole sexual misconduct thing where people we thought were, were heroes and made people worthy or now we realize there's something far less. The Cowboys are six and six. It's just a tough year. <laughs> You know, but we, um, you know, and it's easy for us to feel depressed or, 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 or glum. And, you know, I think, but I think, you know, the days get darker in the Northern Hemisphere. I think this is kind of a human experience. And again and again, what we see is people and cultures look for new beginnings, new starts, putting the, the, the old behind them and looking, to, looking ahead. And we see that, in, of course, in the Chinese New Year, which begins in February, or our New Year, January 1st, where we make resolves and, and, and to take advantage of this blank slate. Or, you know, the, the, the winter solstice, which, of course, in Roman times was the Feast of the Invincible Sun, where finally, you know, light was going to triumph over darkness. And we have today, Advent, Advent 1, where we begin a new liturgical year, where we, where we start the clock in the calendar anew once again. I think all of these are expressions of hope. Hope, that, re that realization, that expectation, that knowledge, that things as, we are, as, as they are right now aren't as they always will be. Hope is important. St. Paul would tell the Corinthians, faith, hope, love, abide, these three. Hope is at the core of the Christian life. But, you know, but the reality is, is that in times of malaise, in times of confusion, I think it's hard for any of us and all of us to have hope in any real and positive sense. When we look at today's scriptures, we realize in today's first lesson that the prophet Isaiah lived in a time not unlike ours, a similar time. And he reminded his people, and he reminded us three things. He reminded us that we should have hope. He reminded us why we often don't have hope. And he reminds us why we can have hope. Today's first lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 64, and, and Isaiah, Isaiah's scholars have divided into three parts, and this is from 3rd Isaiah, which was de dealing with a specific context. In the rarely read books of, of Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that the time when the people of Israel had been in exile in, in Babylon, and through Cyrus the Great, they were able to return back home to Jerusalem. To, you know, to, 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 their, to, to Judah, to their home. And this would, it should have been a time of great rejoicing and they would live happily ever after, but it didn't happen that way. It was times of disappointment, of frustration, of conflict. It was just, a, you know, things weren't turning out the way they, they expected them to, the way they wanted to. And it was into that world and into that frustration that Isaiah speaks. He first articulates, you know, the, the, the problems, the complaints that the people had. He says... Oh, Lord, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains quaked at your presence. You know, what he's telling us, of course, Judah's complaint was, you know, yeah, you know, what have you done for me lately, God? Very, very common complaint. What have you done for me lately? Yeah, we heard all those things you did in the past, but what's going on right now? We remember when you came in power. He said, you know, when the nations trembled, when you did awesome deeds we didn't expect. But what are you doing now? What are you doing now? And Isaiah reminds the people of Israel that they indeed should have hope. He says, from ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God but you who works for those who wait for him. You know, the, when we interview, and many of you have done this, I've done this when I interview for people to serve at the staff here or elsewhere, and when you ask, when you ask people questions, you know, the question you always ask, always ask is, what have you done? You know, they'll say, oh, if I had this job, I can do this and this and this and this, and you go, thank you very much, but what have you done? What problems have you solved? You know, what new initiatives did you develop? You know, how did you make a difference in your previous spot? 
And we ask those very important questions because we all realize that past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. Past performance helps us know what might happen in the future, more often than not. And so Isaiah reminds the people of Judah of how God responded in history, this past performance, how he responded again and again and again when the people of Israel were in distress. He talked about the story of Abraham when God took this lonely, childless couple who thought they had no hope and took them to a new land and made them a father of many nations. He talked about the story of Joseph, you know, where his brothers sold him into slavery and yet God raised him up to be second in command of all of Egypt and ultimately would save not only his brothers but his entire family. Or the story of, of, of the Exodus and Moses where God took a people in slavery and brought them through the, promise, through, through the Red Sea into the desert, into freedom and into their own land. Again and again and again we see God working with, in, in times of distress. And Isaiah says that that's the God that we worship. That past performance is the predictor of future and current behavior. And the reality is, of course, nothing has changed. You know, Jesus looked at the crowds, and Mark tells us that he had compassion on the crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus continues to have compassion on us when we are in distress, when we are lost, when we are confused. Jesus said, come to me, all you that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And Paul would tell the Ephesians, you know, you were once without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of God, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. As Christians, we should be a people of hope. Because forgiveness, the doctrine of forgiveness reminds us you know, that for God, tomorrow is so much more important than yesterday. You know, when we, when we, in a few moments when we do the confession, you know, we confess our need for God and our weakness and our shortcomings. And what God says when in the absolution is, none of that matters. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. You know, we should be expectant, realizing, you know, that, that, that the opportunities and the potential possibilities, you know, that are before us are so much more important than the burdens or the regrets that happened in the past. We should be a people of hope, except when we don't. You know, the reality, I think, is again and again, is, is that, you know, that, that, we, that we lose hope. And it often, so often, the, 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 the truth is, is that our stuff gets in the way of, 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 of God working in us. You know, Isaiah continues in, in today's lesson. He says, but you were angry, and we sinned, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We fade like a leaf. Our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us <clears throat> into the hand of our iniquity. For the people of Israel at that point, you know, God seemed far off, far away, uncaring, uninterested, impotent. And, and, and when they felt that way, the people of Israel went their own way and ultimately fell in the ditch. I think it's what happens with us, too. You know, when we think of our world, you know, capitalism, I think, has, has been, been able more people to, 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 to succeed and flourish than probably any other system. But capitalism always has said it requires people with a moral core. It requires people who are looking not just for themselves, but for, for, but for everybody. And when capitalism, it, you know, this doesn't work, when greed and selfishness mean that some people, you know, amass a huge amount of money at the expense of everybody else. It doesn't work. In the same way, politics. St. Thomas Aquinas called politicians 800 years ago to search for the bonum commune, for the common good. And politics works when we have men and women of character seeking the common good. But politics doesn't work if the only thing they're doing is trying to win or at least defeat the enemy. You know, and for us, I think as individuals, we can get off the rails too. You know, we get off the rails when we, when we become hopeless, when we kind of turn in on ourselves. When we spend way too much time looking at the TV screen or the computer screen or the gaming screen and find ourselves, you know, out of sorts and, 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 and losing peace. We also get out and find ourselves in a ditch when we think of ourselves as, as just as victims, you know, as, as powerless to change, to take control, to make a difference. You know, when God seems far away, when God seems irrelevant, 
Yeah, I think we turn in on ourselves and we find ourselves falling in the ditch. But then Isaiah says the most important word in the whole lesson, three letters, Y-E-T, yet. In spite of all of that, yet you are our father. You know, yet is a very important word. W-A-W in Hebrew, wow. And then, you know, not W-O-W, but W-A-W. But it is, you know, what it is, is it's, it's, we see that again and again in the Psalms and here, where it's a movement from, from, from lamentation to confidence, from complaint to assurance, from despair to hope. He says, yet, O Lord, you are our father, and we are the clay. You are our potter, and we are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are your family. You know, I think there are two reasons here why we can have hope. One is, is that God continues to be in relationship with us. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. In spite of everything, God continues to be in relationship with us. God never abandons us. It's one of the great promises. And that promise is what we are reminded of that promise week by week. You know, as we come up for communion to receive that piece of bread and that sip of wine as a reminder, as a pledge that, the, that God's presence, that the reality of Jesus is not just here, but it's also here, living, alive, offering us his power and his goodness and his hope and his possibilities. He, he never leaves us. And the second thing is, is that he continues to work in our lives. He says, we are the clay and you are our potter. Not only are we created in God's image, but God continues to mold and fashion us into the image of his son. We know that. St. Paul would tell, tell the Romans, he said, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells within you. You know, for Christians, we know the key story, the important story. That on Good Friday, you know, Jesus was abandoned. It was a day of defeat. It was a day of disappointment, discouragement, disaster, pain, emptiness, injustice. Evil seemed to won. Powers, raw power seemed to triumph. But of course, we know that Good Friday is not the end of the story. Good Friday is always followed by Easter, where Jesus rises triumphant from the grave, where death is swallowed up in victory, that new life, new possibilities, God's power suddenly become real and available new and that story can be is our story and in that story we can have hope for when it feels in our lives like it's good friday when we are discouraged when we are defeated when we are powerless when we can know we can know that easter new life new power a new reality is breaking in upon us we you know we can have that kind of hope you know my favorite movies it's an old movie, it's The African Queen, where Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn take this boat down the river hoping to go into Lake Victoria in Africa. And, you know, they go down, have all these adventures, and finally they end up in the, in the delta of, 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 of Lake Victoria. And it's, there's, there's, there's these, weed, these reeds, you know, six, eight feet high. They can't see anything. And even more as they go forward, they suddenly get caught in this muck. And they just can't go forward. You know, the engine stops. He gets, Humphrey Bogart gets down, he tries to pull the boat, and he, you know, he can get it maybe, maybe an inch, maybe an inch. And finally, in the heat and, and the bugs and, you know, and, and the hopelessness, they just they give up, and they realize that, that there's nothing there, you know, that they, they failed. And then all of a sudden, there's a raindrop, and then there are two raindrops. Then there's a torrent, and suddenly the water begins to rise up, and the boat is lifted up, and out they go into, the, into, the, into Lake Victoria, where they have a whole bunch of new adventures. That's the kind of God we have. We may think we're in the muck. We may think we're in the weeds, but rain is around the corner. And so, Isaiah's time, just like our time, is a time of discouragement and frustration. But then and now, believers are called to have hope. Not a vain, empty hope, but a hope rooted in a God whose past behavior is indicative of what he's going to do in the future and what he's going to do in the present. A God who knows that even if we are drawn away, God continues to be in relationship with us and continues to work in our lives, turning our Good Fridays into Easter mornings. May it be so in your life and in mine. Amen.